what it's supposed to do. So all together now, the four programmers, hip hip. And others, three cheers for programmers, hip hip. And the final one for programmers, hip hip. Great, so that's the first time in my life I have managed to program the audience. <laughs> That's a nice first. Um, so what I want to continue about today, I'm very aware that I'm the man standing between you and the party. So I want to keep this short. Uh, I'm very talkative, but I'll do my best. But briefly, I want to talk about why it's appropriate to celebrate uh, programmers. And then uh, I will ruin the mood by highlighting a series of problems that I see in the profession. But then, hopefully, I will again lift everyone's mood up in time for the party uh, by suggesting that we do have solutions on the board. That's my plan. Um, but just a few words about myself. Um, who's this guy talking to you? Uh, the best way to contact me is via Twitter, so I've simplified your options by only including that uh, contact information. Uh, no, who I am? Uh, so that's actually me. Uh, most, pe most people would probably not have... Uh, uh, <laughs> I do have books to give out for a best question, because that's, that's, we have a winner. Um, yeah, so that's me on uh, that's me on the right, um, and you can see from an early age I was uh, a geek, and then later I became a professional programmer. I'm known for uh, co-inventing uh, something called the coding dojo. Is there anyone staying for the code retreat tomorrow? More of you should stay. Um, I have something more to say about the code. If, if you already want to learn more, you can get uh, Emily Bache's book. Um, Emily is a friend, she lives in uh, Sweden. She's a British originally, and she wrote a book about how to put together a code in Uh I'm also uh, working at the moment as an agile coach. I hate, uh, I hate having the title agile coach. I find it restricts me. I used to be uh, to build myself as only a consultant. Uh, and I managed to avoid the title of Agile Coach for more than 10 years in the Agile community. But finally I broke down and became one. Uh, I do still code and I've uh, worked a, a little bit with the Agile Alliance. Uh, I'm actually proud of having shipped software that is in use uh, by visitors to the Agile Alliance website. It's a very small piece of software. It's uh, 30 lines of code here, 30 lines there. Uh, that's enough of me. Um, what I would like to do now, I'm, I'm well ahead of schedule. Nice. It's nice for a programmer. Um, I would like to introduce you to some of my favorite people in the profession because today is a day to celebrate programmers. So, who knows anyone in this picture? There's at least one guy that I hope some of you recognize. Do you know who this is? So, okay, and I'm not completely surprised, he's a discreet person, he's shy. His name is Ward Cunningham, does that ring a bell? Uh, he wrote a little piece of software uh, over 10 years ago called Wiki, uh, which has since then, funny how things happen, become the basis for a little thing that you may have heard about, which is called Wikipedia. He was the original uh, creator of the wiki concept. So you could say he's a programmer who's had a very broad influence in society. Um, this guy uh, up, to, up to the right is Rex Redgrave. Uh, he's one of my heroes. He's an interesting character. He introduced me to uh, 
combinators, which are, which are like the lambda calculus, they are the uh, universal uh, um, ground of computation. Um, you probably don't know these two guys over here, but they are French, dear friends of mine. What does? Sorry? No. Uh, no. Uh, Emmanuel on the right is, a, is the other inventor of the building dojo. Uh, he works with uh, Jonathan, and they do something which I find fantastic, which is they call it the cat eye in the hat. Uh, it's, uh, it's pair programming together with performance art. Uh, it's amazing, you really have to see it. Um, and this is just a random selection of a few of, of people that I consider to be programming heroes. Uh, it's not a top five list or a top four list or whatever, it's just a, a few people that I thought deserved to be recognized. Uh, you probably don't know this guy who is also French. Uh, his name is Fabrice Bellat. Uh, he wrote a little something called QMU. Uh, it's, it's an ATX86 emulator. Uh, and one of the uh, most amazing things I saw earlier this year uh, was his port of QMU to JavaScript. So you can actually open the browser. I'm not going to do this uh, because of time constraints. So you can actually open a browser and have Linux run inside the browser uh, on a CPU emulated by JavaScript. And I saw that, it blew my mind. Um, so he's also very shy, but fantastic. So, we've established that there are some extremely valuable programmers, uh, some influential or otherwise admirable programmers. And you know, you know what's coming next. There is a but there. There's a but coming. Um, yes. So this is an article uh, which I came across recently as I was preparing this talk, which I think makes a very good point, uh, which is to ask whether programmers are actually worth the money, which is not insignificant money, uh, being paid to them. So this guy wanted to be uh, a writer. He spends months uh, trying to come up with a very nice piece, a profile of uh, someone he admires. He, he works at it uh, and he's uh, paid three thousand dollars at the end, which is not a very uh, huge sum of money. So a little ejected, uh, he quits being a writer to go back to being a programmer where he can make uh, upwards of seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year very easily for his words, not mine, uh, wiring together pieces of HTML. He doesn't think that's rocket science. So I think that's an interesting question. I'm make, maybe making some people here uneasy with this line of questioning. It's about to get worse. Um, what makes a bad programmer? Uh, and when you look at these guys, actually exist. I'm coming to that. When when you look at uh, job ads for programmers, you could get the impression that you are valuable if you build yourself as a rock star. And so those guys are the PHP rock stars. It's an actual band. Uh, and not uh, putting their picture up to make fun of them. Although, there is something funny about middle-aged men uh, dressed like that. But I'm making fun of the idea that if you want to know how to make yourself a more valuable programmer, you are going to emulate a rock star or a ninja. So anyone seen any ads for ninja programmers or rock star programmers? Say? No one sees ninjas, that's true. But you have you may have seen uh, job ads for ninja coders. Uh, so what makes a programmer valuable? Being a rock star, being a ninja, being an agilista. 
So this is my little jab at something which I think is ridiculous, which is a giant certification. So if you really, really, really want uh, a certification, it's very easy to become overnight a natural software specialist, ASS. I'm not going to spell it out. <laughs> Um, and then again, it's, so let me try and become serious now, uh, because some of you are probably thinking we are better than that, we are software engineers. Anyone? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I would used to say that I have an engineering mindset, even though I don't have any formal degree, so it's easy for me to make fun of those of you who had the courage to stick through uh, the uh, however many years of education that it takes to become an actual uh, software engineer with a degree and all. Uh, but it's easy for me, but then again, it's easy. Uh, so let's talk about software engineering. Uh, software engineering. The, the problem in software engineering was if you go back to the very beginnings, the uh, NATO conference back in 68, uh, there was a grand ambition in software engineering, which was to combine knowledge about computation. So I've chosen to uh, represent that with a network uh, circuit, combination of very simple gates. Um, and people like Turing uh, and Church and others uh, figured out before computers even existed that there were there were laws of computation. There, there are uh, actual proofs that some things are doable and some other things are not doable with machines that perform computations. I think that's that's pretty cool. Which is another reason reason I was. Uh, uh, enthralled by the book and combinators to Mark Mockingbird. And their vision was to take that science of computation and to say that software development should consist of applying systematic and sound engineering principles combined with well-grounded science to create new stuff, innovative stuff. The same way that other disciplines, or so I hear, I'm not actually an engineer in any of these other disciplines like chemical or, or civil engineering, so it's, it's kind of hearsay for me, but um, what I hear is that the scientists come up with um, new ways of combining matter, or new ways of new uh, theories of how things will respond to various processes and then the engineer's uh, job is to come in and apply those theories and those discoveries to create new products. Except in software engineering, it did not turn out that way. Instead, what we got uh, was the, the hateful notion of software factories. Uh, which was about taking uh, computers and programming computers and, and treating uh, people who worked in that area as factory workers, trying to apply the, the ideas of Taylor and Ford to software programming, to software development. And I guess many of us, because we are here in a conference that has an agile track, I uh, don't think that's such a, uh, a great idea. So that's not, you know, that's not the end of my brief with uh, software engineering. So there's software engineering as a movement uh, which gave us something which, is, uh, which has been denounced as a way to make managers of software uh, uh, developers think they have an idea of what's going on. That's not a very flattering description. It's uh, what uh, it's with uh, Dijkstra, uh, 
uh, wrote, and he was one of the originators of, of uh, software engineering. Um, and the other is, uh, this is the list of topics covered in the proposed uh, certification. I'm noticing I'm, I'm doing in and out. So, everyone is fine with that, or would you prefer me to remove the mic? Okay, well. Um, so this is the list of topics from a proposed certification in software engineering. Um, so what does this remind you of? Uh, obviously that's a kind of an obvious line. Uh, it's with a few additions, the stages of the waterfall process as and, and there is some controversy on whether waterfall ever actually existed, whether it was introduced by Winston Royce in 1970, or whether it's actually, or whether that's you know, more of a, a later reconstruction. I prefer to uh, uh, cite this picture from Barry Beam. Uh, I think of Barry Beam as pretty much the inventor one of the main inventors of software engineering as no practice. And uh, I think he was the first widely influential person in the uh, academic software engineering community to publish this diagram. And he was instrumental in people rediscovering the work of Royce uh, a few years later. So a lot of software engineering thought is still steeped in waterfall thinking. It's, uh, uh, it's really hard to get people out of that habit in the software engineering community. Now, my, my belief with software engineering still doesn't stop there, so I need to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, research in software engineering, but uh, I only have one hour. I'm trying to keep this down to 45 minutes so we have time for Q&A. Um, if you get me started on the state of research, I could go on for hours. So instead, I just want you to show one slide and let you read it. And I think I will just let it sink in and move on without any comment. Does everyone get it? Do I need to comment? <laughs> so this is this is academia uh, digging its own grave, right? We, we refuse to discuss anything that's actually relevant to you and you and you and you and everyone who's actually a practicing programmer. That's one of the things that's uh, wrong. Um, another thing that bothers me with software profession and software engineering as a discipline, but not just software engineering. I'm going to, I'm going to have some pointed critiques at the Agile movement as well. Uh, and, and so this is so much a problem that I found I actually needed to write a book about it, which you can get online from Uh Our profession has a great vulnerability to what I call leprechauns. Uh, I will not go into the origins of the word leprechaun. You can uh, get that from the book. You can get that from the free preview of the book. So this is not to force you into buying the book. You can buy or not buy. Uh, I do recommend it. Uh, it's something that is widely believed that people accept as fact. And in many cases, there were things that I personally accepted as fact. I was convinced were true, but in fact, when you look a little more closely, you find that there is actually no uh, data behind that. Uh, here's one example. Do you know this chart? Anyone seen this before? Uh, anyone, raise your hands if you have uh, heard about the cost of change curve. That's probably a little more familiar term. Uh, so, for everyone else, this is something that 
it's actually a pretty big deal because it, uh, it is the grounding for a lot of the thinking on software engineering and especially the notion that you should uh, do a lot of work on requirements as early as you can in the project because, so the, so the theory goes, the longer you leave a bug in the software, um, the more expensive it is going to be to fix the bug. And it's not just a qualitative uh, law, it has a quantified aspect to it, which is that it's supposed to be an exponential increase. Later you get uh, in a software project from the point where you introduce a bug, the more uh, the cost of fixing the bug is going to increase and that is going to follow an exponential curve. Uh, and this is again uh, due to Barry Beam. Uh, but the problem is when I started digging into this, I found out that the data did not actually match. So that's uh, uh, one of the best studies, I'm going to spare you the bad ones, uh, studies that published a lot of raw data, so we, you could see the numbers, uh, but this, the original study didn't actually make a graph of the numbers, so you couldn't see whether the numbers match the curve. Uh, but obviously that's very easy to do now with uh, Excel or uh, Google spreadsheets. And this is what I got when I plotted uh, the data. Uh, this is supposed to show uh, a smooth exponential. So does that strike anyone as, eh, maybe not. Um, so basically, um, Something that people have been repeating over and over for decades is, is supposed to be a fact, a very basic fact of uh, software, the way software it gets built, uh, turns out to have very little empirical support. So, now it's time to hit the other cheek, uh, so to speak, uh, and to say that the Azure community is not doing very much better at not accepting dodgy claims. Um, so this is something that's been uh, quoted over and over again. I'm, I'm, um, I want to stress with this picture that, that there's a scam going on here, which is that people are saying, oh, this is a very huge study, billions of dollars worth of government spending in the US. Uh, so I'm the first to say, if there actually were a study of 35 or 37 billion dollars worth of projects and it showed, as this study is supposed to show, that, that 75% of those projects basically fail uh, and this is due to waterfall. I would believe you know, that we need to toss waterfall out and bring Agile in like it's a no-brainer. Right? And probably some of us here actually believe that. But the question is, we believe, but do we believe based on good evidence? Uh, so this has been quoted by many, many people in the community, uh, uh, you know, very high caliber people, uh, none other than Tom Gill, who was here recently. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not sticking a knife in his back here. Uh, we've discussed this. Uh, but it's very widely believed. The problem is it's just false. Uh, when I started digging, I wanted to know what the data was. So I started digging and I found, I, did, I could not find the uh, raw data for the 1995 study which is supposed to show this. I did find something from 1979 uh, which brought attention to the problem of wasting millions, not billions. Uh, it's the exact same percentages, but look at, the, look at the title of the chart. It's a study of nine software projects totaling under seven million. Uh, and then again, they were not selected at random, they were, or they were not a, a, a random sample of all of the different projects. Uh, they were selected because they had, you know, because they had problems. So they're not even representative of the whole. Um, 
sorry, back up a, a, a little here to say, um, some of you may be thinking, so what? Uh, I think it's a big deal because it shows that uh, the most careful thinkers in the agile community can be taken in by what are basically, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, a lie. So we've been had. And we're supposed to be smart people. It's part of the thing that makes us valuable. Uh, it's we're supposed to be smart. And so those things disturb me because they uh, provide kind of counter evidence to that. Maybe we're not always as smart as we think we are. Uh, another example, I'm, I'm getting near the end of this slightly uncomfortable uh, segment where I introduced doubt. Uh, and some of you may have been uh, in the Nometrics presentation earlier today, who was there? I found that very interesting, but I'm going to be saying a few things about this no X uh, uh, fashion. Sorry, that's, uh, that's kind of a weapon word. But it all started when people start, you know, were saying Agile is about not having any documentation. So back then we didn't have this uh, habit of sticking words together. That became, uh, that's actually something we owe towards uh, original wiki. Uh, back then the way you made a link in a wiki was by squishing words together like that. So for instance one of the early uh, extreme programming advice was no web database. Um, and of course, everyone has heard of NoSQL, which hasn't been discussed uh, quite a lot at this conference, I gather. Uh, and then we have a more recent movement of no estimates and the variance is no metrics. Uh, everything that these have in common uh, is what I think is a disturbing trend of saying uh, we're going to take one thing that worked in the past, uh, we're going to stick the word no in front of it, and we're going to make a movement out of that. <laughs> Is that really reasonable? So I'm, I'm, I'm half teasing here. Uh, I'm seriously saying that it's not a, a good way to get a message across. Uh, it would be better to make it into a positive, uh, rather than to say no to estimates, or no to uh, SQL databases. Uh, instead, we should say what we have found, which is a, a better alternate solution. Um, actually, there is some value in those movements. They make us question things. Uh, I'll come, come back to that. I think that's a valuable thing. Uh, but it does, uh, to me, stress that not only are we, I think, by and large, confused about what makes a software uh, programmer, a good software programmer, what makes them valuable, uh, it reinforces this notion that uh, software development is not engineering, it's not craft, it's not even art, it's uh, what uh, Reginald Braithwaite calls uh, pop culture. Or, uh, in the words of the, the people who wrote the SEMAT call to action, uh, which was, I don't know if anyone heard of, uh, anyone's heard of SEMAT, it was a call to action to re-think, uh, reinvent software engineering because the author said software engineering was dominated by fashion. And so I don't need to tell you that fashion could lead to uh, some ridiculous extremes. That's one illustration. It's probably not even the worst that I could find. Uh, so you might well ask, uh, you know, even all all those observations uh, that software engineering as a, as a discipline uh, has a, a dodgy history, uh, and we, we seem to be intent on uh, continually reinventing the wheel, uh, tossing away ideas that seem to work before uh, for no better reason than to be seen to oppose uh, uh, the status quo. Uh, are we, do we have any hope? Or are we doomed? Are we doomed to be, you know, forever going in that circle, you know, that fashion cycle? <coughs> or is there any light at the end of the tunnel? 
So to answer that, I'd like you to take a step back and ask yourself, what's in, in everything that I've been discussing so far, what's the problem? Any, any guesses? Do less. Sorry? The problem is to do less. Uh, I don't think the problem is to do less. Okay. It could be part of the solution. <laughs> but I'm asking about the root cause. What do you think uh, the root cause is? Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to be a little blunt, but I actually agree with you, but uh, uh, the blunt answer to that is no, that's an excuse. Um, we know, we, we actually know the root cause, uh, um, and it's something I've actually heard this several times at the conference and from colleagues. Uh, it's software development is performed by people. Give this man a cigar or a book or whatever. Uh, that's the correct answer. And the, the thing is, uh, and that's I guess part of the problem in software engineering, we have this notion that uh, everything would go so well if only we were rational people. If only we thought in logically consistent ways and always had a good reason to do the things we do. The problem is we are not rational, right? It's, uh, I guess, I hope not everybody is too young now to recognize this, and uh, I, could, I could have used the, the other one. Uh, People can prosper. Sorry? <laughs> People can prosper. I didn't get that, that's, that's okay. We are not, we are not Fox. Um, we make mistakes, we don't, so, the thing is, uh, there's this uh, 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 trope in agile circles that uh, every human is wonderfully unique, uh, you know, wonderfully unique snowflake, uh, blah blah blah. No, uh, we are human, but being human uh, is to have uh, something in common with all other humans and to make mistakes that follow uh, fairly regular patterns. So, the takeaway from this whole uh, talk, if you need, if you needed to uh, recall only one thing, uh, is I think what makes your value as a programmer is not, it's not uh, the things you know, it's not your book knowledge, it's not your knowledge of uh, JVM internals or uh, Oracle reference manuals, that's ephemeral. Uh, it is not what you call yourself, whether you call yourself a software engineer or an agile software specialist <laughs> or a certified scrum master or any of those things. It is not even uh, the practices you use. Why? Because those are only going to be applicable at a certain moment in time, at a certain uh, place, in a certain context. That's uh, another word that's overused. Uh, but in that case, it's applicable. It's not the practices. It's the way you reason your way through problems, given that you have a fallible, a, a very much imperfect uh, human brain. Uh, and so this brings me to another, uh, another one of the topics that excites me a lot, and I probably will end up writing a book about that. Uh, it's what I call bugs in the brain. Uh, so for the testers among you, uh, I'm really, uh, when I use the word bug, I use that advisedly. It's verifiable ways that you can hack or exploit or cause the brain to fail. Here's an example. Uh, well actually, before I give you the example, I recommend, if you want to learn more about the bugs in your own brain, that you read uh, this excellent book by Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, which goes into a lot of detail about the way those the way those bugs are caused by systems, recognizable systems in the human mind. Uh, I'm doing pretty good on time. So, just to give you one example, 
because it's very relevant to both software development and testing, uh, confirmation bias. So this is uh, uh, an experimental task that was devised by a guy named Wasson. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and he wrote a, a, a number of papers about it, uh, testing various hypotheses. Uh, and the finding was very robust that when you ask people to uh, come up with examples, to come up with uh, uh, tests, actually, verifications that are needed to uh, confirm or disconfirm whether a certain rule applies. So in this case, the rule is uh, if there is a value on one side, so there's always two cards uh, back to back, if there is a, so we don't care about the value of the cards, we only care about whether it's a, a, a vowel or a consonant, a, a not number or an even number. Uh, we want to check the rule. If there is a vowel on one side, there is an even number on the other side. And what people tend to do, I'm not going to ask you to do the exercise, but I hope you're thinking about it, which cards do you need to turn over? If you ask people, you will find that there is a systematic bias in the answer, a systematic pattern of answers that statistically comes up way more than others. Obviously, people are all unique, so the answers are all over the map, from I don't need to turn, to turn over any card at all. I guess you, you probably get that answer once in a while from someone who hasn't really understood the, the question, uh, to uh, we need to make sure that we need to turn over all the cards, that's, the, 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 that's like the tester who would like to test all the combinations. Uh, it's not going to be very cost effective. Uh, and there is actually a right answer. And people deviate from that right answer in predictable ways. They deviate from that right answer in only checking uh, uh, cards that would confirm the rule. They fail to think about examples that would make them wrong. And that's, uh, so that finding of confirmation bias is very well confirmed. Uh, unfortunate choice of words. It's, it's uh, very repeatable. You can reproduce that in a variety of settings. Uh, and you can see it happening all around you every day. People hate admitting they're wrong, basically. That's, that's confirmation bias expressed as a uh, behavior. Uh, What's actually interesting is uh, uh, if you frame this in abstract terms, people uh, get it wrong a lot of the time. If you make this a little different, uh, you can see an instant improvement. And the way you reframe the problem which leads to instant improvement uh, is that you make it about viol violating the rule. So if you make the rule to be tested that everyone who is carrying an alcoholic drink has to be over uh, 21 or 18 or whatever the uh, age, the drinking age is, then just like that, people will get the answer right. So that's it. It's an interesting other side of the finding that uh, we are, we have bad intuitions about testing, except if you make them about the social domain, in which cases, in which case people get it right. So. Those are, again, verifiable, very robust findings about the way the human brain operates. But how many of you have taken actual uh, classes, degrees in, in uh, software development? So did any of those include uh, psychology classes? Keep your hands up. If, if you, a few of you. So that's, that's an improvement. Uh, I, I will not ask what percentage of the overall content, but I'm guessing not, not a whole lot. Uh, I think it's a very underdeveloped topic. So what I'm thinking we, we need as a way forward, as a way out of the fashion cycle uh, that's uh, doing a, so much harm to the profession, uh, we need to uh, rethink, we, we have to keep the computational aspect. We are all in a certain sense uh, we need to be scientists. We need to be uh, aware of the rules of computation because computation is the medium we, 
deal with. However, I think the missing piece, uh, and if we could just reinvent a discipline that, keeps, you know, that takes that into account, we would be on our way to a much more improved uh, way of working and way of satisfying customers, is by having the human brain on the other side of the equation, instead of trying to control people and trying to mechanize software development. Uh, and, and in very concrete terms, uh, I would like to make this very uh, practical. We need to uh, recognize the bugs in the brain, and we need to come up with patches. Uh, we need to fix those systematic problems. The same way you fix a software bug, uh, you, don't have, you don't have to, in so many cases, you don't have to recompile the original program. We, we cannot do that. We don't have access to the source code. Uh, what you do is you uh, install uh, additional patches uh, that do the job. Here's a very concrete example. Uh, one of the reasons the uh, no estimates movement is popular is because, let's face it, it's one of the bugs in the brain. We are very bad at forecasting, uh, assessing probabilities. This is something uh, the human brain does not do well. Uh, and there have been some workarounds which I think are not actual fixes. Uh, one workaround is for management to say, you must get better at estimating. Anyone heard that before? Um, another uh, way that people work around this is they pretend to give estimates and then later they play games with the schedule. Uh, you all know the game of chicken? Uh, so that's, chicken is when you say, you know you're going to, to be late, but uh, it's not just you, there is also another group working with you, and you both must make the date. So chicken is about, uh, you know you're going to be late, but you don't say anything, because probably the other guys are going to be late too, and when they say they're late, you don't have to say anything, you can blame it all on them. You're going to be in trouble if they don't say they're late, and they're thinking exactly the same way that you think, it's, um, it's a risky game. Uh, so there is a no estimates movement which says just let's try to find ways of uh, creating software that don't require us providing estimates. I also think of that as a workaround, but I think there, there are useful ideas coming out of that. Um, and I think there is an actual solution which is to systematically train to rewire the intuitions that we have about uh, probabilities. Uh, so there's a session that I've been touring in various conferences with, which is called The Art of Being Wrong. Uh, and the short, 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 short version of it is go to predictionbook.com, uh, read the uh, frequently asked questions and, and play that game. Uh, I need to move on. Uh, <laughs> I, I like that quote. I'm going to leave you with a few more inspirational thoughts. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, if, if you're not surrounding yourself with people smarter than you are, you are missing out. Uh, and this is actually it's just one specific... Um, sorry, wrong uh, slide order. It's a specific case of something that you may have come across, which is... Uh, I haven't actually read the book, but I can, I've, I've read enough about it that I can, I think, in conscience, recommend it. Uh, uh, something about the growth mindset. Uh, it, so the experiment that revealed the interesting thing here, if, if you take a, a bunch of children, uh, you have them do a test. You divide them into two groups. To one group you say, oh, you did really well on the test. Well, it's, it doesn't matter whether they actually did well or not well. You all you tell all of them the same thing. You tell them, you did really well, you must be really smart. And then another group of the other half of the kids, you tell them, you did really well on the test, you must have worked really hard. Can you guess what happens? Anyone? Second group does better. Absolutely, over time. It, it, and why? Because it seems that if you, uh, if you convince yourself that your success or failure is uh, determined by fixed characteristics, such as whether you are smart, 
uh, you're basically going to give up. If you're, if you're already smart, then you're smart. You don't need to uh, work hard at being smarter. Uh, if you already don't, well, that's the way it is. You're not, you might as well give up. So people don't make an effort. If you tell people that uh, trying and failing and learning uh, makes them better, then, then that's what they're going to optimize for. Uh, one example, uh, I think, is something I'm proud of uh, personally, so forgive me uh, a few moments of pride, uh, is uh, starting a, a sm smallish movement called the Coding Dojo. So you get people in a room uh, working on a coding problem which is not work related. You're not allowed to work on, on a, a project related piece of code, it's an exercise. And you have two people, the way we do the dojos, there are variants, uh, you have two people using the projector in front of an audience. Uh, you rotate the people from the audience onto uh, uh, the, the, the table where the action happens so that nobody gets left, left out. But the idea is uh, you go through a programming exercise live trying to do your best possible job, knowing that the other guys in front of you are guys or girls. Um, I don't mean to... I fall prey, I'm vulnerable as everyone is to uh, unconscious sexism. I try to correct that. Um, so, what you're trying to do is you're trying to do your best job of coding, your best practice coding, and everyone in the audience is allowed to interrupt you if you lose them, if you do something that they do not understand, that doesn't make sense. They are not allowed, you, they are not allowed to interrupt you just to criticize, uh, or just to say, I will do that another way. No, you don't get to say that, but you do get to say, you lost me here, I, I have no idea what you're doing. Uh, and so you have to verbalize whatever it is you're doing. Um, I think that's, a way to reproduce in uh, uh, the dojo setting, basically. So like, like the martial arts dojo, it's where you go to practice. Uh, it reproduces the really important ingredient of pair programming, which is verbalization. It's saying what you're doing, explaining, making sure that the person with you is on the same page. Uh, and the other thing is regular practice. You're practicing continuous learning. Uh, I have seen people come to the dojo for week after week, for in some cases many years. I have watched as they transform from normal, average programmers into people I really uh, respect and admire, who are able to take any problem and say, sure, we can code that up in a few minutes. Uh, but I want, you know, I want sell you the code in Dojo, I just I, I encourage you to try it. So that's another, uh, I think, a practical consequence of taking into account the way the mind works. Um, another batch, this one, this one goes to the, the problem with so many uh, half-truths and myths uh, floating around the community. I think we need to install a batch for skeptical thinking. I like the Wikipedia way, which is to say, citation needed. We need to have a reflex of saying, oh, you claim something is the case about software development. Show me the data. Uh, give me the papers. I, need, I will go and read the original sources. This skepticism is a critical uh, patch for <laughs> what I think is a, a huge vulnerability in the human brain. Uh, another one. Some of us have that. I think it's, uh, in many ways, it's among the things that propel us into the profession. But I think curiosity is something that we can also uh, systematize, practice, train, really, really become curious. We, we tend to be curious, but selectively curious. Uh, when you start being curious about, especially about things that you might be wrong about, that's real curiosity. Uh, I'm going to end. I really want to take uh, some time for questions, and uh, I'm a little over the time I set for myself, but I'm under the official time. Uh, it's a little trick uh, I learned as a programmer. Uh, I'm going to leave you with that. None of us have all the answers. 
none of us is perfect. Don't believe the people who are so confident in what they tell you. You must do things this way. I know. We are all scrabbling in the mud, in the mess. We are all, in the words of Oscar Wilde, in the gutter. But some of us are looking at the stars. And I guess because you are here today, that's, that's all of you. You are here because you want to improve, so you are among those looking at the stars. I congratulate you on that. Keep it up. Thank you.